Welcome to the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. This podcast is devoted to helping increase your daily exposure to God's Word with a short scripture reading and brief commentary on key ideas, themes, and theology in each chapter. Now please join your host, Dave Jenkins, for today's episode. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this show, and today is October 28th, and today we're going to look at Deuteronomy 9.25 through Deuteronomy 10.11. Now, just by way of reminder, every day I read from one chapter of God's Word, and then I offer a brief explanation of key ideas, themes, and the theology in that chapter. My goal is to get you into God's Word for about 5 to 20 minutes or so. So let's get to our reading today from Deuteronomy 9.25 through Deuteronomy 10.11. And Deuteronomy 9.25 through Deuteronomy 10.11 says this, So I lay prostrate before the Lord for these 40 days and 40 nights, because the Lord has said He would destroy you. And I prayed to the Lord, O Lord God, do not destroy your people and your heritage, whom you have redeemed through your greatness, whom you have brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Remember your servants Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do not regard the stubbornness of this people or their wickedness or their sin, lest the land from which you brought us say, because the Lord was not able to bring them into the land that he promised them, and because he hated them, he has brought them out to put them to death in the wilderness. For they are your people and your heritage, whom you brought out by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Chapter 10. And at that time the Lord said to me, Cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and come up to me on the mountain and make me an ark of wood. And I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets that you broke, and you shall put them in the ark. So I made an ark of Achaia wood and cut two tablets of stone like the first, and went up the mountain uh, with the two tablets in my hand. And he wrote on the tablets in the same writing as before, the Ten Commandments, that the Lord has spoken to you on the mountain out of the midst of the fire on the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them to me. And then I turned and came down from the mountain and I put the tablets in the ark that I had made. And there they are as the Lord commanded me. The people of Israel journeyed from Baruth ben Jacob to Maserah. There Aaron died, and there he was buried. And his son Eliezer ministered as priest in that place. From there they journeyed to Guda, and from Guda to Jobeth, a land with brooks of water. At that time the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi to carry the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, and to minister to him, and to bless in his name to this day. Therefore Levi has no portion or inheritance with his brothers. The Lord is his inheritance, as the Lord your God said to him. I myself stayed on the mountain as at the first time, forty days and forty nights, and the Lord listened to me that time also. The Lord was unwilling to destroy you. And the Lord said to me, Arise, go on your journey at the head of the people, so that they may go in and possess the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Well, this is our reading today from Deuteronomy 9.25 to Deuteronomy 10.11. Now, in much of chapter 9, Moses has been explaining the golden calf incident at Horeb in a way that did not strictly follow the chronological order. So after talking about how he spent 40 days and nights on the mountain fasting and praying, and how God heard his prayer and spared his people, he backtracks a bit and describes the prayer that he prayed in Deuteronomy 9, 25 through 29, and then proceeds to describe the change of fortune resulting in the progress that the Israelites enjoyed after the prayer in chapter 10. Now, verse 25 of Deuteronomy 9 expresses again the serious crisis that faced the people and the submissive and earnest prayers of Moses when it says, So I lay prostrate before the Lord for these 40 days and 40 nights because the Lord has said he would destroy you. Now, verses 26 through 29, they record the prayer of Moses, which sounds like an argument Moses had with God. Now, like a lawyer, Moses reasons with God as to why he should not destroy the Israelites. 
Wesley Duell, in his wonderful book, Mighty Prevailing Prayer, has a chapter titled, Holy Pleading and Argument Before God. He writes, this holy argument with God is not done in a negative complaining spirit. It is an expression not only of a critical heart, but of a heart burning with love for God, for his name and for his glory. This holy debate with God is a passionate presentation to God of the, and one of the many reasons why it will be in harmony with his nature, his righteous government, and the history of his holy intervention on behalf of his people. Abraham argues like this with God over the destruction of Sodom in Genesis 18, which, like Moses' prayer, has a combination of both boldness and humility before God. So we see Abraham arguing and God conceding points based on his request until a way is found for Lot and his family to be saved. As we talked about in our last episode, it is a mystery that the sovereign Lord of the universe chooses to act in this way, but it indicates that our prayers do carry weight in God's scheme of doing things in his providence. And J.I. Packer gives another reason why God acts in this way. From insights gained from the writing of Bishop J.C. Ryle, John Owen, John Calvin, and P.T. Forsett, he says, God may actually resist us when we pray in order that we in turn may resist and overcome his resistance and so be led to deeper dependence on him and greater enrichment from him at the end of the day. In other words, God lets us debate with him for our own good and for the deepening of our faith. The main argument Moses makes in his prayer is that the Israelites are God's people. The ESV as Moses using the words you and your 12 times in this short prayer of four verses in Deuteronomy 9, 26 through 29. Verses 26 and 29 of Deuteronomy 9 are typical when it says, O Lord God, do not destroy your people and your heritage, whom you have redeemed through your greatness, whom you have brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand. For they are your people and your heritage, whom you brought out by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Daniel prays a similar prayer uh, for Israel when he concluded with these words in in Daniel 19:19, 19, 19, saying, O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O my God, because your city and your people are called by your own name. Now, twice in his prayer, Moses refers to the Israelites as your people and your heritage in Deuteronomy 9:26 and Deuteronomy 9:29. His point is that God must protect the Israelites because they belong to God. They are God's covenant people. So God's honor is at stake. Defeat for God's people is an affront to the glory of God. And now Jesus expressed the attitude that we're describing here in this episode when he cleansed the temple. After recording the incident, John comments this in John 2.17 when it says, His disciples remember that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Now the verb consume is in the future sense, but in Psalm 69.9, the source of that quote is, it is in the past tense. And now some scholars believe that the change to the future tense was because the disciples felt that zeal for the temple would destroy Jesus and bring his death. Jesus was willing to sacrifice his life to take away the dishonor that came to the name of the Lord God through his temple being misused. Now, the honor of God's name is one of the motivations that drive us in our prayers for and commitment to the church. We may be utterly disillusioned with the church, and in this era where lasting commitments are so out of fashion, we will be strongly tempted to leave our churches when something happens there that infuriates or even hurts us. But this is God's church. We cannot leave the church so easily, for it bears the name of God on earth. We will identify ourselves with God's people and even seek to bring about change so that the church will better reflect the nature of God. Henry Martin was one of the most heroic figures in the missionary history. After graduating at the top of his class in mathematics and receiving the coveted Wrangler Award, he shunned the prospect of prosperity in England and went to India as a missionary to Muslims. After translating the New Testament and the Book of Common Prayer into the Hindu language, he went to Persia, which is now Iran, and translated the Bible into the Persian language. 
Once, when he was in Persia, a Muslim friend told him about an incident that is supposed to have taken place during the Crusades. He said, Prince Abbas Maraza killed so many Christians that Christ from the fourth heaven took hold of Muhammad's skirt to entreat him to desist. Martin says, I was cut to the soul of this blasphemy. The friend, observing his distress, asked Martin what was so offensive about what he said. Martin replied, I could not endure existence if Jesus was not glorified. It would be hell to me if he was thus to be always dishonored. The astonished visitor asked him why Martin says, he said, if anyone pluck out your eyes, there is no telling why you feel pain. It is feeling. It is because I am one with Christ that I am so dreadfully wounded. He had a passionate commitment to the honor of the name of God. Now, twice in this prayer, Moses appeals to the fact that the Israelites have been redeemed by God, whom you have redeemed through your greatness and whom you brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand. In Deuteronomy 9.26 and Deuteronomy 9.29, their redemption accompanied by great miraculous acts of God would be rendered meaningless if they were destroyed now. Destroying them after this is like throwing away something very costly. What a terrible waste this would be. This is the same thing we can appeal to when praying for the church. Speaking to leaders from the church at Ephesus, he says this in Acts 20, 28, Paul does. Pay careful attention to yourselves and all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. So we can pray to God to consider the huge price Jesus paid to save the church so as to prevent that price from being rendered meaningless. Now, when we apply this after Calvary and realize that Christ died in our place and for our sin, then we begin to look at people with eyes tinted by the gospel. We begin to see people as those for whom Christ died. A great price has been paid for redemption. What a tragedy it would be for any person to be lost. And this is why we should be telling people to repent and to believe and put their hope and trust in Christ alone. Now Moses now follows another path in his appeal to God. He asked God not to regard the stubbornness of the people, but rather to regard the promises made to their forefathers. In verse 27, he says, Remember your servants Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do not regard the stubbornness of this people or their wickedness or their sin. Always the promises of God are greater than the sins of the people. True, there are promises that include judgments for stubbornness, and we must not neglect those. But scripture says in Romans 5.20, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So we can appeal to grace to overcome their sinfulness. We can even evoke the covenant promises of God to plead for the mercy of God so that he can do what he promised to do for the church. Moses did this invoking the promises made to the fathers of the Jewish nation. This is most interesting considering that God was offering Moses the opportunity to be the father of a new nation in Deuteronomy 9.14. But he would have none of it. And so he appeals to God to consider the real fathers of the nation. We can appeal to this prayer for revival or healing of our churches, our families, or our organizations. We can see how the promises give us boldness to believe and thus earnestly to act ask God to act. We can even pray things like this. Lord, you promised to give us all these blessings, but we don't presently enjoy them. Please give us these blessings to us in your time and in your way. Now, there was a great revival in the Herbert Islands in the north of Scotland in the mid-20th century, the effects of which are still today uh, said to be evident. This revival has been linked to the earnest prayer of two sisters named Miss Smith and of a group of seven young men in a church. The latter group covenanted to meet three nights a week in a barn to pray for revival. They committed themselves to pray in keeping with Isaiah 62, 6-7, which says, I have posted watchmen on your walls, Jerusalem. They will never be silent day or night. You call on the Lord, give yourself no rest, and give him no rest till he establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. They believed God had a plan for their islands, and they decided to storm the gates of heaven to give God no rest until that plan was realized. Well, one day as they prayed for one of them, led them in an act of confession and consecration. Heaven broke loose and the revival that began with that small group spread to the whole island and then led them to many of the other islands. In all of our lives and in, in, and in ministry, 
there is always the grace of God, and God's grace is greater than all sin. The promise of God is sure there can be victory. There is freedom in the name of Jesus Christ. According to Luke 4, when Jesus came, he opened the scroll, and he unrolled it, and he read in Luke 4 the scroll from Isaiah 61, which tells us that Jesus came to set the captives free. And so braced with even our own confidence in the promises of God, we are to persevere in the work of being faithful to God as revealed in the gospel. Now next, Moses goes back to his theme of God's honor. In the first and the last verses of the prayer, he reminds us that the Israelites are God's people in Deuteronomy 9.26 and Deuteronomy 9.28. In Deuteronomy 9.28, he says that the destruction of these people will bring shame to God. Lest the land from which you brought us says, say, because the Lord was not able to bring them into the land that he promised them, and because he hated them, he has brought them out to put them to death in the wilderness. Now the most awesome thing in the world, its greatest wealth and its reason to exist, is the glory of God. The biggest tragedy in the world is that so much of it does not recognize the glory of God. The great climax to which history is moving is the day when the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea in Isaiah 11, 9. Therefore, the greatest ambition that drives us is enhancing the honor of God on earth. And now when that honor is diminished, it is a tragedy beyond comparison. Moses says that the destruction of the Israelites will be such an event. And so he asked God to spare the people so that the Egyptians would not interpret that action in a way that is dishonoring to God. Now, how important it is for us to maintain this perspective of jealousy for the honor of the name of God. When a good project that goes against the stream of worldliness by upholding God's principle is allowed to go under for lack of support, the Lord God is dishonored because people say that it is not worthwhile or possible to follow God's principles in this world. So out of our commitment to the honor of God's name, we should support the project at a personal cost to ourselves to keep it from going under. And when Christians go to courts against each other or battle each other in public, the world laughs us and God is dishonored. Paul says that it is better for us to suffer a personal loss than be a cause for the biggest tragedy to happen, for God to be dishonored by our fighting for a legitimate cause of ours in 1 Corinthians 6, 5 through 7. This is why we cannot keep silent when we see things that dishonor God in our church and in our society. Jealousy for God's honor banishes So when we see things that need to be confronted, rather than just ignoring them, we ask God, what should we be be doing about these things? So we see that though Moses' prayer was specifically for God to have mercy on the Israelites, the underlying theme was the glory of God. Their destruction would dishonor God for four reasons. First, they are God's own people. Second, he had redeemed them before. And that redemption would be rendered meaningless by their destruction. Third, the promises God made to their forefathers would be rendered meaningless by it. Fourth, it could cause people to say shameful things about God's motives for saving his people. May our lives be similarly burdened by the vision of the glory of God so that all that we do and all that we ask of God may be motivated by his passion. Now, Deuteronomy 10 through 11 gives us a summary of what happened after and as a result of Moses' prayer. The fortunes of God's people changed and they began to move forward and progress again and again. Now, first, God renews his covenant with his people. He tells Moses in Deuteronomy 10, 1, Cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, saying, Come up to me on the mountain and make an ark of wood. On the tablets, God would write the Ten Commandments, which were all that was written on the previous tablets. A wooden ark was to house the tablets. In this very brief summary of a complex process, Moses says that he made the ark. It was Belzeal who would actually have made it, according to Exodus 37.1. Moses initiated and directed the process. Therefore, Moses' claim is legitimate and is, is such a brief summary. Next, Moses says in Deuteronomy 10, 5, Then I turned and came down from the mountain and put the tablets in that ark that I had made. And there they are as the Lord commanded me. The account in Exodus shows that this whole process took a lot of time. What we have here is a summary that highlights the fact that the covenant was renewed. 
All this leads up to verse 12, where God tells the people what was required of them, a heart religion that majors on obedience. J.A. Thompson explains the requirement that the covenant document was to be housed in the ark as a reflection of secular practices in the ancient Near East. It was normal to lodge copies of the treaty document in the sanctuaries of contracting parties where they were under surveillance of the deities who would guarantee the treaty, and in case of a breach of treaty would visit the party with judgment. This is another case where biblical religion uses some of the practices used by people in the society in which it is found without assimilating the system behind those practices. Here, the ark and the tablets are used as visual reminders to the people that they are a covenant people whose lives are controlled by a treaty made with God. Our passage implies that there was an act of renewal of the covenant in connection with the bringing of the second tablets by Moses. The account in Exodus 34 clearly describes what happened. The tablets and the ark were symbolic of the covenant and the path of obedience that it includes. There is still a place for such acts of corporate renewal for our commitment to God, along with some ritual or even symbolic reminders of what that commitment means. When people do not experience a vital relationship with God, these rituals and even symbolism become a substitute for heart religion and are sometimes considered a means of salvation. Evangelicals who are alert to the dangers of the misuse of corporate rituals and even the symbols can go to the extreme of neglecting them altogether, an equally dangerous error. Now, to Deuteronomy 10 has a beautiful combination of the symbolic and the ritual aspects and the heart religion aspect of the life of faith. Verses 1 through 5 of this chapter, they present the symbolic with the ark and the tablets that will be constant reminders of or to the people of the covenant. Verses 12 through 22 talk about a religion of the heart in response to the love of God. Even the New Testament has a place for symbolic rituals enacted in communities such as the Lord's Supper and Baptism. We can also follow Moses' uh, precedent of renewing the covenant after sin by having services of repentance. If we find that we have moved from our primary call, a service of, of repentance to the call could signal a new phase in the life of our group. If we find that apathy and sin have entered our, our community of faith, we could have acts of community confession and repentance, especially after we what we call revival meetings. The restoration of a Christian who has been uh, disciplined can be accompanied by a service of restoration. The same can be done with a couple whose marriage had gone through tough times and are now ready to start afresh with the help of God. Sometimes these services will be done with the whole congregation or with a group. Sometimes only those in the inner circle need to be involved in it. These events could be preceded by a period of fasting that affirms our serious intent to follow God's will over our personal desires. Now, verses 6 or 10 of Deuteronomy 10 are in the third person. It may be an explanation, addition, rather than a part of Moses' speech. For this reason, many translations have this section as a parenthesis. With this covenant renewed and the people's relation with God restored, they are able to restart their onward journey. Verse 6 says, Mazra, Aaron died, and there he was buried. He too would have been restored to a relation with God and answer to Moses' prayer for him. And therefore, he probably dies of natural causes rather than as a punishment from God. Deuteronomy 10.6 says his son Eliezer ministered as a priest in his place. Now after Aaron's burial, they proceeded further in the journey. Now there are some differences in the details of the account here and the parallel accounts in Numbers 33. The Numbers account presents itself as an itinerary, whereas in Deuteronomy what we have is a very brief summary statement. So we should go to Numbers for details about the itinerary. The locations of most of the places mentioned here have not been identified with certainty. The purpose of these verses in Deuteronomy is to state the fact that they started journeying after the terrible golden calf episode. Names of places are mentioned, but probably without much attention being paid to the chronological order in which the places were visited. This happens sometimes in the Word of God, such as the record of the temptations of Christ and Matthew and Luke, where the order of the second and the third temptations is reversed. Now, verses 8 and 9 of Deuteronomy 10, they include a note about the Levites being set apart for the work of God. Now, four things are said about them. We're going to look at two of these when we look at Deuteronomy 18. 
These are the call to stand before the Lord to minister to him in verse 8 of chapter 10. And the rule, according to verse 9, that Levi had no portion or inheritance with his brothers because the Lord is his inheritance. The other two things are the duties of the Levites to carry the ark of the covenant of the Lord and to bless in his name, according to verse 8. The task of carrying the ark was entrusted to the Kohathites, who are a non-priestly family of Levites, according to Numbers 3 through 4. That task was needed during the journey of the people, and they carried it on their shoulders. The Kohathites were also responsible for the care of the tabernacle and the services pertaining to it, according to Numbers 3. This was very important work in the Old Testament and needed to be done with meticulous care. Therefore, considerable space is given in the Old Testament to describing this this work. There would not be a direct equivalent of this work today because we do not have a tabernacle or as sacred an object as the Ark of the Covenant. But when we remember that these were the visible reminders of God's presence with the people, we could say that the equivalent of the Kohathites today are those whose service has to do with special occasions and places that show the presence of God. Included here would be getting the sanctuary prepared for worship so that it is a place that gives people an environment conducive to worshiping God in spirit and truth, according to John 4.24, with reverence and awe, according to Hebrews 12.28. This includes architects, interior decorators, janitors, those responsible for maintenance, and those who arrange chairs and flowers. Some of us are not alert to these aesthetics things. We need people who love God's worship, who are aware of His holiness and love, and who are committed to beauty and order to help us prepare our places of worship for for use. And considering the space given to this type of thing in the Word of God, we need to emphasize that this is an important aspect of the service the church renders to God. Now, the other Levite responsibility is to bless people in God's name in verse 8 of Deuteronomy 10. This is a privilege that Christians, especially leaders, have. Mary Evans explains that to bless somebody is to express a hope or a prayer that good, desirable things will happen to that person. There are several blessings mentioned as having been given to people in both Old and New Testaments. Sometimes blessings are pronounced on individuals and other times to whole groups. The most famous biblical blessing was the Aaronic blessing, which we still use today. In Numbers 6, 24 through 26, it says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God usually mediates his blessing through others. And one of the ways he does this is through Christians pronouncing blessing on others. This is something that all Christians can do, and leaders have a particular privilege and responsibility to do. Now, the most common way blessings are pronounced today is through the benedictions that are said before the gathered people of God leave. Today, the leader often substitutes us for you as the object of the blessing. This misses something of the biblical significance of God's blessing as being mediated by God's representative to another. Sometimes the gathering is asked to say the blessing to each other. In such a blessing, this significance can be retained if we pronounce the blessing in the second person rather than the first. That is by saying bless you to each other rather than bless us. We need to rediscover something of the sense of the importance of the simple statement like God bless you. When we want to communicate a loving desire for good to a person and there is not much time to do it, the best way to express our wish briefly is to say God bless you. It is an expression of love and desiring the best for the person. Let's restore the practice of blessing people in God's name among Christians today. Before going into a further exhortation to holiness that begins at verse 12, Moses summarizes what happened after the people's sin. This shows the power of Moses praying. He says, I myself stayed on the mountain as that first time, 40 days and 40 nights, and the Lord listened to me that time also. The Lord was unwilling to destroy you in verse 10. There is a clear link being implied here between Moses' prayer and God's unwillingness to destroy the people. They are now ready to proceed on their journey. So Moses says this in verse 11, And the Lord said to me, Arise, go on your journey at the head of the people, so that they may go in and possess the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Now Moses' prayer is powerful. You know, you and I, we might not feel like praying. Often it's difficult to make an extended time for prayer. But we need to pray. 
this conviction to pray, it helps us to overcome our laziness and our inclination to activity rather than contemplation on Christ as revealed in the word and to prayer. After all, James 5.16 says, The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Well, I want to thank you for listening or watching today's episode of Reading the Bible Daily with Dave. My name is Dave, and today is October 28th, and we've looked at Deuteronomy 9.25 through Deuteronomy 10.11. Until tomorrow, may the Lord richly bless you and keep you. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show and rate us wherever you listen to podcasts. Be sure to also like, subscribe, or follow Servants of Grace on Facebook, Instagram, X, or YouTube. We appreciate your support.